Now that I've disconnected Logic 16 from one of the USB ports, I'm able again to sample using the USB SX at 8 mega sample per second, and I've captured some uh, patterns here for you. This is the same data that we captured using like Logic 16. And you can see the software looks very similar. I can define protocol analyzers for RS232 or IS2C, and it does essentially the same thing. Uh, you can pan left and right, but it doesn't have that inertial panning that Logic 16 or and Logic has, uh, which I find very useful. And you can see here I'm decoding uh, the data again using ASCII. One feature that this software has that I like is that on the right side it shows the traffic, uh, the decoded traffic. It can be very useful if you want to quickly see the messages back and forth, a whole bunch of them without having to pan through the data. So maybe that's one of the things that uh, people uh, who design Logic 16 and Logic can maybe incorporate into the program. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to take a look at Logic 16 and put it through some stress tests and see some of the fastest uh, transition that it can capture. I also want to try some 1.8 volt logic on it. So let's take a look at that. So as a final test for you guys, I wanted to test Logic 16's capability of capturing high frequency square waves. One easy way for me to do this would be to use just a crystal oscillator, connect the output of the crystal oscillator to Logic 16 and see if it can tell me the frequency of oscillation. So the crystal oscillator that I was going to use today is this Motorola 20.48 crystal oscillator. Uh, this guy can run, um, typically run, should run from 5 volts, but I've tested with an oscilloscope that if I reduce the supply voltage to it, the output swing will go down and it will work all the way down to about 1 volt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this to Logic 16, uh, set the supply voltage to say 3.3 volts, run Logic 16, see if it can tell me the frequency of oscillation, then I'm going to continuously reduce the power supply and find out at what point it's not able to tell me the frequency anymore. And it's at one point it's not able to capture the output uh, wave pattern. So I've taken one of these guys, I have two of them, I have connected it right here. Uh, these two micro hooks that actually came with uh, Logic, I've used these guys. They're very difficult to connect to actually, you're going to have to kind of uh, figure out uh, which orientation works best. Once you click it, they'll make a little clicking noise and it, it works well. So I've used four of these. Uh, I have the positive, uh, this is the negative terminal, I have the negative terminal, the positive terminal, and I have the ground uh, that's connected to the ground of the power supply. And I'm using uh, the zero, the channel zero of the Logic uh, 16 and uh, I have everything hooked up. Right now I'm running the logic, uh, I'm running the uh, oscillator at 3.3 volts. It's consuming about 16 milliamps. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to leave this setup exactly as it is. Then we're going to go back to the computer. We're going to check the software. We're going to uh, set the channels to only the first two channels, set the maximum sampling rate, and see if it gives us the correct frequency. Then I'm going to continuously reduce this voltage, and I'm going to tell you what voltage it is set to. I'm going to keep running it and see if it, if it works. Okay, back to the computer. I have the Logic software running again. And right now I have all 16 channels enabled. And I know that the crystal oscillator is at 20.48 megahertz. So if I were to run this right now at a maximum sampling rate of 12.5 megahertz, I know that the software will make mistakes in calculating the frequency because there will be aliasing. So let me do that. Let's try that. Start. So we can see there's a whole bunch of uh, samples. So let's zoom in. Go to the very beginning. And if I hover over here, you can see first of all that the wave, um, the, all the transitions are not the same width. But it's telling me that, the, that it's somewhere around 6.25 megahertz and 4.17 megahertz, which of course don't make sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable a whole bunch of these channels and only keep uh, the first two channels for the maximum sampling frequency. So I go to options, I go to logic 16 channels, and I only select channel 0 and 1. So once I do that, everything else disappears. Now I can select 100 megahertz uh, frequency for the samples. I start again, and now I can zoom in even more, and go all the way to the beginning, and I can see a much more uniform pulse width, and I it's telling me that the frequency is around 20 megahertz here on the right side. It will show up right here. So 20 megahertz is pretty close to what it actually is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reduce the power supply. Right now we're at 3.3 volts. And I know that 
here at the input voltage, I'm actually selecting 1.8 to 3.6 volts. If I were to increase the voltage, I can select uh, this option. So let's try that. Let's go from 3.3 volts down to 2.5 volts. Right now I'm at 2.5 volts. Start again. Same thing. Still pause me 20 megahertz. So everything is still working. Gonna go down even further. 1.8. So now we had 1.8 volt logic. Run that. No problem. Still captures 20 megahertz. There's no issues whatsoever. Gonna reduce it even further. Let's go to 1.2 volt logic. Run it again. Again, no problem, but it's beginning to show some signs of trouble here. Every once in a while, like these little pulses. But still, it's still is estimating the frequency to be around 20 megahertz, which is pretty impressive, meaning that you can capture some pretty narrow transitions and still have reliable um, frequency estimate. And if I go even further to 1 volt, and yes, now it no longer works. But at this point, really, the crystal oscillator is also beginning to fail. So it's not only the Logic 16's fault that this is happening. So I think this is a, covers a, a very good range of things that, for you to see that Logic 16 can do. Uh, it really is a very, very nice uh, product and a, and a great upgrade uh, from the existing Logic. So now I'm going to the, take it apart and so we can take a look what's inside. If you want to see that, uh, please watch the next episode in the blog sequence. So what do I think of these two products? I think they are really, really good. The design is fantastic, the build quality is great, uh, the software is really well thought out and very easy to use. I'm very impressed with the, the capability of Logic 16 and it goes to show how much uh, more thought has gone into building this and how much it has evolved from the original Logic. Uh, for the price of two of these, these are $149 each, you can get one of these, but of course the capability of one of these units is far exceeds two of these combined. Especially because the software doesn't really allow you to put two of these together and get 16 channels out of them. If you want simultaneously 16 channels, you're going to have to buy one of these guys. About two, so these guys go for $299 each. Um, Maybe a little bit expensive for uh, hobbyists and students, but it's well worth the price, especially with the buffer that's built into it. You can get the highest sampling rate all the time. Now, with the test that I've done, I've only really scratched the surface. There is a lot you can do with these, and you can go really into depth of testing these in detail. But feel free to leave a message, leave a comment, or join the forum and discuss this, and I'd be more than happy to answer some of your questions if you have something specific. And uh, next, I'm going to create another video where I will take these guys apart. We can take a look at it, we can look at the PCB, see how it's designed, comparing it to the USB SX, so we can learn something about how these guys have managed to put this thing together. So, follow us in the next video.